Hello, and then a hero comes along with the strength to carry on. And you cast your fears aside, and you know you can't survive. So when you feel like hope is gone, look inside you and be strong. And you finally see the truth. And that hero lies in you. Hello, hello, everyone. That was just on my spirit just now. Um, wow, what a terrific, terrific and splendid way to fellowship and to hold space. Uh, I would love to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Queen Jean. Pronouns are she and her. And I show up in this world as a costume designer and a storyteller. And I'm so thrilled and deeply honored to be able to share space today with two uh, prolific, powerful, inspiring. Truly, these designers are the vanguard for our future. When we think about alt, art, culture, and decor, so I give to you Dominique Von Hill. Hello, everybody. My name is Dominique Von Hill, pronoun she, her, hers. Um, I am blessed to be in this space with you guys today and also amongst the presence of these two phenomenal storytellers and costume designers that are revolutionary. Um, I pass it on to Devario. Hi, Devario. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. I'm Devario Simmons, he, him, his costume designer, and so lovely to sit okay. with you all. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing you again, yeah. can never see you ever. Okay, I know. Oh, ain't that it? Um, so I would love to just start, uh, just to call into this space um, with an intention. And that intention is a verse from uh, Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, and he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil to put on your whole armor of God. And so today's conversation truly is about the divinity of storytelling. And as designers and costumers that we have the power through our own experiences to create, to heal, to transform. That the characters that we are putting on stage, the characters that we are breathing life into have more than a story. They have a purpose and um, Truly, uh, that scripture really spoke to me today because I feel that oftentimes in a society, in this current climate, uh, we are battling for a lot. Battling for space, battling for access, battling to stay afloat, to be sustainable, to turn our dreams into a business to make sure that literally we are not only seeing ourselves reflected, but we are seeing the joys and the fruits reflected back upon to us. And I just wanted to say that uh, truly what is so divine and to me really feels quite like a testimony is that these two individuals um, have truly um, been on this journey since the very first day that I started. My very first audition, um, I had no idea what theater was, but someone said, look, they, you know, you could sell, they have a, a job fair, and you could get you a job during the summer. And I met this individual, and truly they have not only shown me kindness, but they have truly inspired me to be able to stand here today. So it is such a great honor to be with you, truly. And this incredible sister who is, uh, to me, a deity, a living goddess, um, she and I worked together for my first jobs <laughs> in theater as a, as a practitioner. I was as a tailor, and um, she's a designer. And it was so uh, incredible to see how this young woman was creating, was, was literally making sculpture. And in so many ways that the way that she was approaching her work felt like she was, that it was ancestral. That she wasn't just, um, nothing was... Um, uh, you know, folks say, you know, like not everything was intentional. Um, and that was such a powerful uh, experience to see your work. Um, and we know there's so many more stories, but um, you've shown up for me in more than one way, in moments of sadness and moments of celebration. So thank you, Dominique Von Hill. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. Um, 
with that gratitude. And so for today's conversation, we really want to share with everyone, and this is just an open forum, uh, about building character. What does it mean to create characters? What does it mean to, to collaborate uh, in this moment, right? Uh, we are in a, a moment of awakening for uh, a lot of uh, per, you know, personal art, um, professional collaborations at many in different institutions. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about character, about collaboration, and the final thought that we'd love to share with you all is around, um, about the future. Um, what do we uh, want to set intentions for, for how we're creating this work and what we feel needs to happen for us to continue doing this uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant storytelling. So uh, we'll start with Dominique. Um, so the first question to you is really about, um, about costume design, but what does costume design mean to you? Um, and what do you hope that folks um, understand when they're seeing a show, when they're seeing your concerts, or when you're addressing a client? Um, so I, I grew up in Bronx, New York, right? And so if you've heard anything about the Bronx, you know that it's literally like um, the most upper class section of New York City um, <laughs> as much as possible. You know, it's like Fifth Avenue, you know what I mean? Um, and one thing about growing up in the Bronx, if you become like a particular type of personality, you start to people watch because what you understand is that your survival is also sacred. And so that's how it was for me. I stayed really quiet to myself and I observed people. And so what that allowed me to acquire over the years is a sense of empathy. And that's what I take when I do a costume design. It starts with, even if it is the protagonist um, or even if it is the most menacing character, you know, let's, right now, what's the, what's the buzzword? Like a Sweeney Todd, right? Even if it's the lead individual in that story, you must find empathy within that person because when you're able to do that, you're able to break the threshold for the whole synopsis of the story. Um, and that's kind of how it starts. It starts with empathy. Why are they doing this? What, what happens when the door closes at night? Um, what makes their heart sing? What are they afraid of? What do they live for? And what dreams do they have that they're not able to bring to manifestation, but they hold dear to their heart? And then you take that, right, um, esoteric notion of sense of self, even if it's not in the script, and you translate it to tangible situations. How is the cuff folded? Um, what type of button that they have as a heirloom from their ancestral um, deities? Uh, how do they walk through the life that they want to live rather than live within the representation of how they have and their fabricated sense of self? And then you start building up characters. You start seeing what the body is saying, because one thing, um, my mentor, Judith Dolan, taught me in graduate school was that the body is primary. Mm -hmm. And all of these beautiful individuals up here knows, and if you are artists in the, in the audience, you know that like you can have a vision in your mind of how this is supposed to be. Oh, this is gonna be amazing. Completely beautiful, I love it. And then you get into a fitting, or you get into the space, and you realize that they're not correlating. You can't force it, because the body, the situation, and the story, and your ode to the community is primary. Your ego, right, in the words of Eckhart Tolle, is secondary. So you have to diminish it in order to make the dream come alive. So for me, it starts with empathy, and then the rest falls in line, like, naturally. Thank you so much. That was powerful. Um, Devario, same question. Um, how have you come to arrive at costuming, and what does costume design mean to you? Um, I think it's funny that we both start with stories from our youth. Um, when I was younger, I had a great, great aunt who um, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of people in my family that I've known, a lot of generations. And I had a great, great aunt, Aunt Mita, that wore gloves every single time that I saw her. Um, and she was a child of the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. and, and she passed away at 93, and I saw her for the last time at 92, and she had on gloves wow. and high heels. And I think when I think about a defining character of, of a specific character when I'm reading something, that's kind of what I'm going for first. Um, what, what are you going to walk into? What will you view first that'll tell me who you are before I, you open your mouth? Um, I think even today, when we all three stepped on this stage, you know who we are. You may not know who we are, 
but we gave you cues to figure out who we are. So um, I, I, I try to use clothing to support dialogue because it is a collaboration. Um, and, and it's so beautiful that you brought up the body because I'm working with what you're bringing to the table as an actor. Um, so you may, the character may be sexy on the page, but you too have to bring sexy with you when you walk through the door. This red dress or this, this heel is not gonna make you sexy. This, 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 the inside is what's sexy. I'm just supporting and working with what you're bringing to the table. Phenomenal, thank you. Okay, I, I, I'm feeling sexy today. <laughs> thank you, beloved. Um, and I wanted to pose a question to both of you because um, I really love what you were saying about character um, and also about, um, I, I really want to talk about um, or ask you both about your process. I think oftentimes folks say, you know, research. And, you know, I think research is just, okay, research. Um, and, and I don't think folks realize that there is such a, a nuanced uh, understanding of research. Uh, research can be lived experience. Research can be a, a photo album, right, that a grandparent or a relative has kept over the last few decades. Uh, research is your own experiences uh, eating at a diner, right, and truly taking note of the uniforms, taking note of the tile, taking note of the hat rack that's right behind you at every booth, right? Research um, is about the evolution of footwear, um, in terms of it being practical, of it being fashionable, of it being cost efficient. Research um, truly is, can look like you and me, even in this room. So I wanted to ask both of you about uh, your understanding of research history, right? And when we think about the technology of costuming, I mean, this predates uh, man in so many ways, right? When we think about, well, you know, where does the costume come from, right? And we think about uh, stories um, in Genesis, you know, um, you know, even from this idea of, of cloth, of being covered, Emotionally covered, spiritually covered, and so I wanted to ask you about um, about that for you, about researching where does it come from, um, and how does it really inform the work that you do. You want to start? Oh, okay. um, <laughs> you know, this reminds me of um, when I was doing my thesis in grad school, and I was having a hard time really understanding. Um, I did in the next room with the vibrator play by Sarah Rule, which is Victorian um, and, 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 and very Anglo um, and, and very upper class. I have no problem with that part. But um, I just really didn't identify with these characters. And it's like I could most definitely build a beautiful, expensive dress, but does that mean that's what this character is going to have on and how this character moves? And I found myself um, doing even more reading with literature. Um, I think that sometimes as a costume designer we get bogged down with images because we are, are, are visual artists. We, we're sculptors and visual artists, so like the final product is, is, is something that we see. But I do believe that it's very important that you, in your research process, that you also realize how these people need to move. Yeah. Um, while I'm in a fitting, I'm very, very interested to see how this garment's going to move. So I get you dressed and then I just say, can you walk for me? Um, because I need to know what that's going to communicate also. What is the weight of this thing? Um, um, are you weighted right now? Are you troubled? Do I, do I want this garment to have a little bit more f like gravity to it so that I can really, so that you can can feel it and we can see it um, as we're going through this story. So um, I'm a big believer in getting beyond just the visual aspects of finding um, of finding your 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 costume design and your and, and, and how you're going to get there because there's so much more to be told about saying that like when this Victorian woman sits down how she has to sit because of her corset and all of her undergarments and like the fact that she has a bustle that actually she's not really even sitting on the chair, she's perched against the chair. You can't see that in a museum on a form, but you can read about that. Um, and so that does give you a little more insight into the psychology of where your characters are um, when you're going through that process. Thank you, that is brilliant. Oh, come on, psychology, yes. Okay, well, people don't know the work that we actually do, the fires that we put out. Okay, Dominique. <laughs> yes, so um, 
You know, it's interesting because I think it starts with understanding how you are as a person and the best way that you learn, right? So very early on, I knew that I learned and I thrived in small communities. So I was like, okay, when I was applying to graduate school, I was like, UCSD is the perfect place for me. First off, when I first left the Bronx, right? I was like, I'm going to La Jala. And they were like, La Jolla. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going, <laughs> La Jala. Like, I'm going to La Jala. <laughs> Take me to La Jala. But it was more, <laughs> it was more of the yeah. sense of understanding the blessing, right? The yeah. full ride was amazing. Understanding the conjunction with La Jolla Playhouse, but also loving the fact that the classrooms were small and intimate. But before I went there, I had this experience because um, at OSF they had uh, this fair program, it's like fellowships, assistantships, internships, and residencies. And I was attached to the show called The Unfortunates. And The Unfortunates was like this grotesque, beautiful, super gnarly situation. And I was in the fitting rooms, but I was also like a fly in the wall. But I noticed that the costume is on design in a way that was unconventional, right? It was collage. And I was like, I like that. I love this idea of this messiness. I see the beauty and, and mess, and I see like the eye of the storm in the, in the realm of the chaos. And so I kind of took that in my journey and I like ran with it. And um, that's how I do research. I understand the rules first, and then I learn how to break them and tort them in a way that I can make sense of it to bring the characters to life, especially if you have um, something that is, is, is begged in riddle, like Susan Lurie Park's Venus. That was my, my first major show. And there's this line in the show, if you guys are not familiar with it, please read it. And it was, um, they were speaking about this woman and she was riddled with different spots and they were, they were attaching themselves to like vitiligo, but they didn't say it. And so what Devara was mentioning about <laughs> the body and research and trying to convince these individuals of a certain notion, we had an interesting case on our hands, right? When I had to dress her, because I was like, I want to put you in this makeup so that you have spots in your skin. I also want to make you little Bo Peep so that you're dancing around. I also want to give you pigtails so you can tap into the words of the pick and any at that time and all the racist paraphernalia that I was having. And then on top of that, I'm going to put a noose around your neck, right? So she's looking at me being like, no, you're not. And I was like, yes, I am. But the reason why, but the reason why I was able to do it, like what these beautiful individuals saying on stage, is because I did the research. So I had to back up what I was saying. I was like, I'm not doing this because of ego. I'm doing this because they considered you as cattle back then. That's why the noose is around your neck, so they can have full range of when you come in and when you go. Little Bo Peep is dressed when you first see her as something that is amicable and sweet, but you're wearing this dress because you have this preconceived notion of when you were as a little girl and when you felt the most free, right? And the two pigtails that I'm putting on top of your head, those are symbolizing the bull horns. That's why I'm doing it. So it, it starts with understanding the rules and learning how to break it and understanding that sometimes the way that you communicate might not be pretty. It might be messy. Your job is to get the vision out and then understanding how the shops work and finding a common language is a bit secondary in that case. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and honestly, Dominique, you touched on something that leads us to our next question is about the not only the framework, right, but there's an entire, uh, I guess if you think about it, like a little ant farm, right, you know, you see a little mound on top, but a lot of folks may not know that there is a, that costuming truly is engineering. Uh, and the engineering is that there's uh, infrastructure um, way beyond, and oftentimes it's in the basement of every little building. If you're very lucky, you might get a little rooftop situation. But there is a, a tribe, a very dedicated team of artisans, makers, milliners, hat makers, uh, painters, dyers, distressers, right? And these are just folks that, you know, you can you know, hop on a call. But then there are the artisans, right, that literally only knit and so we have to cultivate with them. There are folks that only make jewelry, right? That have this understanding of artistry in the way that they can translate it from your design, from your sketch, from your piece of reference, from your collage even. And so what folks may not know is that the, there is such an investment into costume design that oftentimes gets so overlooked and it gets reduced. Well, just go to H&M. My, who, who has H&M? Do you know how much time I've spent that we have spent in creating and cultivating character? It is not only dismissive, it is disrespectful. Disrespectful. 
literally, I mean, and, and I think part of it too is um, folks have the attachment of costume equals spectacle. And while, yes, we all love a little pomp and circumstance, a can-can, we love a Laduka boot, we love a rhinestone boot, we love a rhinestone belt, we love a, a gypsy hustle, any of it, right? We can all get down and groovy. But there are characters, there are stories that require more, that requires for you to tap and reach the soul of humanity. And it can only be expressed in a handmade garment, and a painted garment, something that's been created and then destroyed so that it can embody and truly reflect where we're meeting this person on stage, where they may be in their life. The H&M could never truly achieve. And so my question to you is as a collaborator and truly as someone who I, uh, both of you, who are leading, I think, this idea of what, what it means to, to, to design, what it means to be a storyteller, because it's not just design. You know, designers come, here's the, you know, hi, this is the meet and greet, I'm the designer, I'll see you at tech. You know, we're storytellers, right? Folks may not know that truly, even before this has started, there has been an investment, not only in research, but in, in culture, in art, art history, humanity, decor, Sociology, where are these people coming from? What is the land that they have acquired? What is the land that they've been brought onto? What is the language there? How have garments and clothing been made? Where has it been cultivated? Where has the fibers been cultivated? Which mammal, which animal, right, has produced the cotton or the, the wool even for us to create this? Then we can get into uniforms. Oh my God, then there's politics and costume. These are literally things that we not only uh, um, understand, but they're truly in the back pocket and our black book of our tools. And so my question to you both is, um, when you're approaching a, co a collaboration, um, how do you assess how you're going to move forward? And in terms for folks that may not know, it's like, you know, I'm doing a production, uh, let's say, uh, we, the piano lesson, right, which is on Broadway that you can check out until I think the 21st. But if you're designing the piano lesson, how do you start to design? And this is something that is a past era, so it takes place in the 1930s. Specifically, the piano lesson. Oh, no. Uh, well, it could be any show, but I'm just saying. But for context, something that um, is either coming from a past era or truly it could even be an era that you're creating, right? We just came from an Afrofuturism, incredible, credible um, dialogue between artists who um, are taken from the past and are recreating for the future artist and a future audience. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think it starts with. So, costume designers are a little crazy. Um, in terms what? of, we have to literally, and I'm sure it's like this for any type of artist, or even if you have something more practical in terms of your profession, we immerse ourselves completely into the time in terms of like, and correct me if I'm wrong, you start to see it in your everyday life. Mm -hmm. Like, you start to smell it you know exactly what shops closed when, especially if it's a period piece. You start looking at these images. You start seeing the hairstyles everywhere. You start asking questions. You uncover, you know, the Da Vinci Code, whatever it is. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and you, you just go down a rabbit hole because yeah. we stay up so late. We have so many folders, so many ideas to the point where our cup is runneth over with like how we can develop this show. And our jobs are to be of service to the direction of the piece. So we're really servants, creative servants, to be honest with you, to the point where sometimes I like to say our babies will have to like be diminished in order to service the story. So no matter how you start the piece, whether it's, you know, snow rabbits on ice or you're doing the seagull or you're, you know, doing Black Panther, whatever, you start with what is the most truest version of this production that I can tell? And when you get to that, you start to go down this whole paradox of, okay, who are these people? Why is his eyes in this antique photograph like photo? Like, why is his eyes a slightly askewed? 
Who is this person? What does he eat? What does he drink? Why is his shoe a little lumpy on one side? You start figuring out, okay, this person may have um, a condition in which that he's leaning more to the left than the right. So you start to understand that, okay, in the fitting, we're gonna hem that leg higher than the other. You just immerse yourself in these characters. And the part about it that kind of gets me every single time is that when a production's dumb, you have to release it. Mm. And it's, it's really, really hard sometimes to do so because you've spent months, sometimes years, with these stories and with these people, and they live apart, like they have apartments in your heart, yeah. but you have to let it go, and then you start anew. So it's a beautiful, bittersweet symphony, I would like to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I normally start with just wanting to know what game we're playing. <laughs> when I think about like each production, it's like like e sometimes you have a high concept, sometimes you're in naturalism, sometimes you're in realism. Like sometimes I really want to have a super intense color palette, so I have to figure out how to make that work. And so that's kind of where I start when it comes down to my collaborations with my with my production team and my director, because I just want to know what game we're playing. Mm -hmm. Are we are we are we running water realism? Uh, are we are we are we cooking a full cake on stage and smelling it in the room? Because that also lets us know that these characters need to be that real to us. So now I can, now I have to make sure that my patterns are period accurate. You know, because now we are now we're telling a story, like we're we're, we're taking everyone in a time machine back there and we're sitting them in their living room and watching these people do the thing. Or are we doing Black Panther and are we taking them to a place that we've never been before? And so now I actually can play a little more because now I'm introducing you to something new. Um, so that's, that's mainly how I start all of them. Like, what game are we playing? Because I, I, I really like color story. I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I really like color concepts. I um, find myself using very intense color palettes whenever I can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I find that that doesn't work all the time. Um, and, 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 that, and, and, and you learn how to get out of your own way also in collaboration. That's why it's important to also expand your group of people that you work with. Um, it's very nice to work with the people because you already kind of know how to, what game we're playing and how to do it, but um, it's very nice because you can stretch your, 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 your muscle a little bit when it comes down to your collaboration because as an artist, um, we often do the thing that we like to do. Yeah. Um, and so to always strengthen yourself and to, and to make yourself um, a little more well-rounded, it's good to get that other perspective in there. Um, I've been saying, I've been um, teaching every now and then at, ten, at, at UT Knoxville, and I tell them all the time, I'm like, once you know what game you're playing, it's fun. We can do Romeo and Juliet as a ballet. We can do Romeo and Juliet as an opera. We can do it as like anything, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's just about that for me. Yeah. Okay. Child, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> okay. At the City Dreams. Okay. <laughs> um, I, that actually, oh my God, this is so divine. Um, to my next uh, idea, really, about, um, about storytelling and abstraction. And, and, and sometimes the weight of that can really fall on, uh, on the clothing, the attire, how we are viewing the character, how they're even adorned. And I think oftentimes that in collaboration or productions, um, you know, resources, you know, no surprise, but they are not adequately or equitably uh, disseminated, shared, allocated. Um, and so oftentimes, um, you know, not, not always, but, you know, for a greater part of it, it feels like, you know, like you're coming in, you know, under deficit, right? We don't have enough time. Okay, we got two more characters. Child, we got understudies. Um, we got no money, you know? There's no money! Uh, you know, and, and, and what I loved about what Devari said is like, what game are we playing? You know, and so oftentimes, if you're lucky, if you've worked with your director, if you have a relationship and trust, Right? I mean, you know, sometimes we'll go to a director and be like, okay, they don't have no money. Um, uh, what do we want it to look like? How do we want it to feel? Right? And then this collaborator can help us to, to, to facilitate, right, the reallocation of resources. But oftentimes folks do not have an awareness, right? When these productions and when these collaborations are happening, we're not in the room, because let me tell you, those budgets would look very different. 
right? But we're not in the room, so these things are planned sometimes budgetarily a year in advance, right? There's a board that comes up with this number, and they reallocate, and they're like, okay, you know what? This is how we did it in 2022. This is what's going to be in 2023. But those are not the same productions. They're not the same artists, right? It's not the same vision, and so it's very hard, I think, as a working artist and esteemed artist, right, to recreate a vision uh, with resources that actually may not adequately support what needs to happen. And so therefore, the creativity comes in. We're always being creative for free. Um, okay, for free. But I wanted to ask you both about, um, you know, what does it mean um, when we're having to not only synthesize, right, ideas, time, sculpture, um, things that feel relative, things that we can associate with, right? We want for the audience to know, you know, literally folks realize, well, we're in no time. You know, sometimes you'll read a script, the uh, location, anywhere. <laughs> um, location, a time from the past. It's like, oh, okay, work, you know, you work. And sometimes, you know, it'll say, you know, Biloxi, Mississippi, 1952. You know, a streetcar named Desire, or wherever you may be. And so, but the, the work that we do as collaborators, right, is we have to fill in those gaps, right? We might be in a location, in an environment, excuse me, we might be designing in an environment, right, that is sparse. Sometimes it's ornate, right? Sometimes it's very, uh, well, you know, I guess it, things can feel practical, right? Folks are turning on the switch, turn, you know, but there may be where it, it's, it's barren, and so this allows us to focus on character, language, movement, space and time. But what folks don't realize is the clothing is doing a lot of work, right? It's filling in a lot of details down to the hair choice, down to the nail polish choice, right? Down to fit, right? How are things looking? Is this person regressed? Is this person even eating, right? Where's this character going? Where have they already walked, Father God? Right, and so what state are they in when we meet them? And I often think about, um, you know, everyone loves the good old uh, waiting for Godot, right? Because it's a little tree, and we got some people. But waiting for Godot, okay? Which y'all waiting on Godot? <laughs> okay, uh, we don't know when Godot is coming, Lord. Maybe next generation, but but truly, waiting for Godot can be abstracted in any, any landscape. But it is up to the designers, right? It's up to the, to, to, to the medium that we bring that helps to inform that, to inform character, to, to, to inform relativity, to give age, status. Um, you know, Gogo and Lucky Child, they're not two of the same, or they could be. And so um, I guess my question to you is like, when you are, um, when, when you have to, to make definitive choices. And sometimes I call it character specificity. How do you arrive at that? And, 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 do you, and, and are you in constant collaboration with the actor, the performer? You wanna start? Okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I think that I'm an I'm a, I'm a overcomer of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing I'm gonna do if I have a question is go see what the character said or what another character said about that character. Mm -hmm. Because maybe my answer is there. I want to know that first. I want to know what the word says. Um, after that, um, I'm fortunate enough to be working on a, a, a new opera right now called Factotum, and there's a character that is uh, being, he's, he's, he was deployed, and now he's finished. He's coming home, and that's all we know. Yeah. And so I'm like, what rank is he? Um, was he in a battalion? How long has he been in there? What is his last name? Mm. And I feel like in those moments when, 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 when writers don't give us um, that information, I, I kind of toss the ball back to the director to see if there are feelings there first. Mm -hmm. um, because I want to make sure that I'm in line with um, the concept um, see it, like head. Um, I, I like to think... Visionary. Yes, yes. I like to think that, the, I, I've been saying lately that like the director's kind of like the god of the production and then like he's, he sends his production team out so I get to be the, the, the god of style during okay. this time. Uh -huh. um, so, so I am Anna Winter in this world, technically. Um, and 
with, without those specificities of that character that I'm speaking about in the Army, um, I end up doing a lot of research and just trying to figure out why was he there. Um, and, through, and through his language, we find that he's running away from the south side of Chicago, um, which means that he's trying to get out of a place that does him no good. But he's also not invested in anything, which means he's not making a career out of the army, mm -hmm. right? So he's probably not that awarded yeah. when he comes back home. This is a job for him. So he ends up, for me, being one of the lowest ranks, yeah. you know, um, which, which is not normal when we write a character that's been in some type of national servant service in a show. We don't ever have a character that's gone and risked their lives and come back and has done nothing. Um, so I actually find this character to be very beautiful and unique yeah. because he, he, he's running um, um, from his situations on the south side of Chicago. And, and for him, he's there for that government check. And when his time is up, he is out. Yeah. And that's where he is. So that's kind of how I fill in those blanks. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> so remember when I said costume designers are crazy? Yes. Um, I mean that in the utmost beautiful way because of how our minds just go in 10,000 different ways. So it really starts with the director and just like listening to them. Right, I'm doing this show right now, Little Foxes, and if you guys don't know what Little Foxes primarily is about, it's um, the Southern family, 1900. The script literally says 1900 in the South. Caucasian family comes from a sense of money. There are been about more money problems, um, and there's you know a murder, or I don't say murder, a purposeful watching of somebody die in the in the play. And so in the beginning, when I'm speaking to the director, I'm like. What do you want? What do you want? And she's like, I want, I want it to be, I want it to be eerie. I want it to be sleek. And then the second meeting, I was like, okay, what do you want? I want it to be sleek. I want it to be, I want it to be a horror. I want it to be, okay, cool. Third meeting, fourth meeting. I don't know. I just want it to be sleek. I want it to be a horror. So what am I hearing? What am I deciphering from what she is saying? I'm hearing that, and this is a beautiful part of what we do. You actually don't want the play to be set in the setting that the play is supposed to be set. Because our job is to know our research. And Victorian period is nothing but sleek. You actually want to bump it up to the Edwardian period. Let's talk about that. And so once I showed her images of both times, she said, I want that. I said, OK, let's roll. So that's the beautiful part about our job, is just listening to what the director wants, seeing if it's amicable or, or seeing if it's practical to do, and also if there's a huge anachronistic issue with terms of the story. We're not gonna lose the story of the little foxes if we bump it up, right, a decade. But you said sleek, and my job is to give you that sleekness. Get out of the Victorian, go to the Edwardian. So um, it's about listening, deciphering, not losing yourself also, because even though we're in a sense of servitude, we still love what we do, and we still pour our heart and soul into the creative notion, into what we do, and finding our unique voice and our unique spice while doing that. But primarily, the director speaks, you listen, you decipher, you ponder, you give them examples, you give them options, you see what the best one is, you talk about money, and then you produce. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And um, I wanted, you know, two, uh, one quick thought I had is about, um, you know, I'm looking at the stage and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. There is um, three different um, histories that are standing before you, city before you. Um, and, and each of us have had our own histories, our own access, um, our own relationship to our past to our relatives, to our blackness. And, and honestly, I think that oftentimes we, um, there is no one experience, as we all know that. Um, but there is something that is um, necessary in each of those experiences that is worthy in each of those experiences. And, and even if we all were to collaborate on the same project, I trust you that they would really be all different and so that I think is the beauty in that what we do is literally, the, it, it's envisioning. And sometimes, you know, you can read a script and race is not even described. 
right? But, and, and sometimes, you know, we love a, you know, blind casting. Uh, it's like, oh, here we go again. Okay, you know, blind casting. But what, what, what's exciting, right, is that it's an opportunity to just imagine, right, who these characters are, who the performers are, right? And so for us, you know, again, it could be little foxes, but, you know, in a lot of the research, you know, that you may see on the surface, right, I mean, they could cast um, a Asian woman. They could cast a black trans woman. I mean, they, they can cast any actor who is ready to be in that role. And as a costume designer, we're going to make sure and ensure that they not only feel confident, but that they are truly resonant in that role, and so folks may not even have that capacity. It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, we're not showing them a research, right, of these women in like a Harper's Bazaar. No, we're not doing that. So there is, a, within the technology of what we do, we are literally archiving and excavating who these people are based on the performer in front of us. Because I believe you, within all of antiquity, we have existed, we have been here, queer people have been here, black bodies have been here. And so to me, I think oftentimes folks feel limited. It's like, well, well you, know, this, you know, it could be a streetcar named Desire, or even most recently, Death of a Salesman, right? That I believe is closing today, unfortunately. But, you know, we can reimagine these characters as anybody, any family. We love a good old family drama. It could even be the Tyrones. I would love to see, you know, uh, the Tyrone's honey, right, as a, a family in Detroit, right, or some Haitian folks down in Miami. That can exist. But it truly, it's the intentionality in how we um, bring these people into fruition. And we share that dialogue, not only with our director, of course our director is going to support that, but the writer also supports us, whether or not they may be living or not. So, um, and the final question that I have for the both of you um, is about armor. And I would be remiss if I would not acknowledge that where we're even sitting today, right? We are in this sanctuary. Can you call it that? Not really. Okay. Uh, we're in a, uh, um, you know, we're in a building that has truly a history that goes beyond us. But, but we're all connected to it. Our ancestors are connected to it. Literally, them that have polished and shined all of this silver in this next room, right? All the armor, the wood that is truly on these walls, right? We know where it comes from, where the lineage of it is, the blood of the people where it is. And so my question is about armor and building character. And truly, it doesn't matter who, it can be any character, but they have an armor that they're carrying, and that armor, as any of us know, if you even try to put on one of these replicas or, you know, one of these uh, um, historical pieces, they are quite heavy. The armor that people put on, that we put on, everyone put on armor today to even come here. Your armor could be a tube of lipstick. Your armor could be your fame, you know, maybe get a Kate Spade bag, okay? Your armor could be your hat. Your armor could be your braids. Your armor could be anything that you put on, anything that allows you to be deeply seated in your purpose. And we know that the armor is not only heavy, but the armor is essential in your survival. So I wanted to ask you both before we close out, um, what is the armor that you carry in this world? Oh, you good. <laughs> I mean, I know we don't have to run away. So y'all all right? If we, I mean, we all know. I, I, I got the five, but. We didn't practice this. I know, I know, I know. Um, my, the armor that I actually had to dismantle within the last couple of years is that being a black woman meant that I had to endure every single day of my life. Mm. Hello, hello. Um, the biggest lie known to me. Um, I'm not my trauma, I'm not my pain, I'm not my past. Those things have molded me to the resilience that I have today in terms of being able to be blessed to have several opportunities and to grow and nourish my sense of self. But at the same time, I do not have to be shackled, all puns intended, to that version of who I was yesterday. Mm. I have 
an unlimited amount of permission to be different than who I once was, to smile, to walk, to be happy, to be sad, to wear my headscarf in a fitting, to play whatever music I want in the costume shop. I do not have to sit there and uphold this preconceived notion of what you think an artist should be. I am me, and every day I am learning to use my throat chakra to pronounce my words of my soul to you. Hi, Dominique Fonhill, nice to meet you, right? And that's my armor. My armor is understanding that I could be soft. I don't have to be so callous all the time in order to get what I want. I don't have to be this rigid, whatever, you know, we worked with some people probably in the past that we were just like, I will never be like you. I could be soft and funny and goofy and I can, I can frolic and I could still be busting with my designs, period. So that's my armor. My armor is looking at armor and being like, I can choose when and when not to put you on. And right now I choose to be soft. I say. I would drop this mic, but you know, I can't pay for it. <laughs> um, I am from the deep south. I'm from South Carolina, and I grew up um, in a very religious family, um, and 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 a, and a family that was very invested in in. in respectability politics. Um, my family is well to do where I'm from. Um, and and what, I, what armor I put on now is that um, I deserve to do whatever I want to do. Um, yeah. in, in this moment in my life, I think growing up religious, if, if many of you don't know, in a lot of religious backgrounds, you grew up very unworthy of things. You learn that your deity, you, you talk to them and you are unworthy. That's kind of like the, the mode by which a lot of things go through. Um, and I'm very grateful to think, to know that like my armor is that I am worthy and I do deserve. And, and I deserve to design at the Met. Period. You know? Period. I deserve to design oh. the next thing that I want to design. And, and, and I'm good enough to do it because I, I am. I've, I've done the work. And I think that um, even growing up with like mentors, you know, we, we have some very powerful mentors, like all three of us, and, and they are still working yeah. today. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes as, a, as, a, as an artist apprentice, you kind of feel like you're not worthy to do the jobs that they, that they do. That you shouldn't do the jobs because like that's for them and then you'll get your time, but my time is now. My time is overdue. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and so I think that's just like the place that I'm in right now with, with my armor and, and, and how, I, how I walk into every room is that I, I can have whatever I want because I'm worthy of it yeah. and, 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 and I deserve it. Yes. You know? So that's kind of where I am right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ashe, I uplift that. Truly. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a, a couple questions, but I'll just share. Um, I, honestly, I asked the question, I'm like, oh, Lord, what is my armor, Jesus? Um, I used to think that my armor, right, was in being liked, uh, being, I don't know, past, uh, <laughs> there's so many things on the surface. I now know, for, without a shadow of doubt, my armor is when I'm free, yeah. is when I'm most liberated. And sometimes that's, you know, without this, you know, magical hair, uh, sometimes I don't have to get on the Zoom and give you femme. I don't have to, I don't need to um, deliver to you something that you perceive of me as a black woman, a black trans woman, a black queer woman, any of that. I think my, truly, so for me, my armor is freedom. And, and it has been, it, felt, it has felt like a lifetime to arrive and to understand that. Because the live, I'm, I'm living in a world that doesn't see me as free, that is not ready for me to be free. So I need my armor every day, baby, because look, I can be met with so much harm, so much trauma, so much angst, the gaze, the white gaze, all of it, the ridicule, the speculation. You know, you'd be surprised. We can walk into a lot of rooms as artists and right there, and we, and there's a tone. And for some reason, oh, oh yeah, that's right. I still have to show you why I belong here. 
I still somehow have to, you know, re- 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 you know, present my resume because the myth of meritocracy, because you've had to pull up your bootstraps, but you don't think that I've done mine. You don't think that I belong here. And even in this armory, do they belong here? Okay. So because of that, my armor is my freedom. And I make no apologies and no literal, no, no, no exemptions about it. So I'd love any questions from anyone. How you doing? Hi, if you could just give us your name. How you doing? How are you? Well, thank you. Um, you like to be amplified. Is the mic on? Great. I have been a costume designer or stylist for a very long time, and it's the first time I've ever seen black and queer people, so I think that we need to give this an applause. I'm, I'm in tears by it. Um, it just has never happened. You're always, I know for myself, um, when I walk in a room, they're like, you're the wardrobe person. I'm like, no, but I can do that. And that feeling of always having to pull out a resume or show people your work, um, but also we're talking about pay equity here, right? And you know, costume designers are paid less than the caterers. Right? Yes. And that's a huge issue. There's a union called Local 829. And that's a huge issue. We need to be paid more. We need to be given the right residuals when our stuff becomes dolls. Because it happens, right? But I find in the space of contemporary, um, I'm always been asked to do something that's African American, right? And what I, I want to acknowledge with you guys is you're doing things that you know, I've wanted to do, which is like Siegel or Bertolt Brecht's Conversation in Exile and not be a black artist, be an artist that can come in and take a concept and I bring something new to it, but not just bring, you're just going to do that black thing, aren't you? And I'm like, what? Huh? Uh, what? And you're like, the kind of racist, but how do you guys, uh, how did you diversify your work? Did you go and seek those projects or there were projects that came to you because of your body of experience? Um, I've been fortunate enough to um, start my career doing like everything. Um, And I think because that happened for me, because of my mentor, I was able just to continue stepping into those types of shows actually like now in my life I'm actually doing more African American shows than I've ever done and I actually appreciate that um, because it is um, something that I do feel like I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that uh, the the more we do our own things the more we'll get more things done. Does that make sense? Like right now when we think about the ratios of what types of things get produced it's like 30% yeah. All the other races, 70%, one race, right? And I think that my goal um, in, in working in this industry is to produce as many things and to be part of producing companies that do as many things of people like me because we should yeah. do a black streetcar named Desire. Yeah. We should do a black death of a salesman because those stories resonate. You know, like at the end of the day, we don't get along with black our families, Lemis, too, personally. You know, and so I think that for me, um, it's just how my path have taken off. I've never really sought it. Just to answer your question, like with a period, um, but yeah. Um, I think it starts with declaring to the universe and to yourself that you're good enough to do it. Right? You're like. I can do a Game of Thrones a lot. I can design an all black craft movie or play. And then seeking out those projects, going on IMDB or looking on Playbill and seeing who are the people doing the things that I love to do. See, I'm a professional stalker, respectfully. It's a costume. Um, That's actually oh. required when you're a costume. Okay, yes. <laughs> Period. Period. And I'm, it's going to be short, but I saw Moonlight, right? And I was like, I know the costumes on the black. I know she black. I know she black. The way she tied, the do-rag, the sneakers on the... I know, I know she black. I know she black. So I emailed her, and I was like, I, know, I, I need to meet you, because I know you're black. We're going to bond. We're going to 
eat some you chicken. Because all black people love to drink grape juice. You know, we're going to drink some grape juice at the farmer market in L.A. So, I, so she called me. She's like, hey, Dominic, where are you? And I was like, I'm right here, but I don't see you because I'm looking for a sister. Okay? And then I meet her, and she's not a sister. Um, and I was like, I was like, hello? And she was like, hey, girl. I was like, hey, girl. Girl. Um, and I was honest. I was like, I got to be honest with you. I can't even hold you right now with these heirloom tomatoes in front of us. I thought you was black. And she was like, that's a high compliment. I was like, why? She was like, because that movie kicked my ass. And she was like, the director, right, Barry Jenkins, wanted her to be on the show. I mean, wanted her to be in the movie. And she said, the only way that would be on the movie is if you basically pay either the actors or someone that is of this culture to do consultations so that we're not all embarrassed. Right? And I had to respect this woman for that because do your research. You know what I'm saying? And seek out those opportunities. So I would say for you, my love, if you want to do more period shows, look at what major theaters or what film companies are going into that and then inquire and do cold email and cold calling to get your foot in the door. And I think the opportunities will come. And also release yourself whatever preconceived notions that you might have about somebody, some place, some genre or something. Mm. And you got this because you're good enough to do it because it came into your mind originally, so it was your dream to manifest anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I mean, just, to, I mean, um, before I graduated um, school, um, we had like a lecturer and they said, Queen, uh, I'm gonna give you this piece of advice. You walk into any room, like you own it. Because what you have to say, no one else can say. And they can't say it quite like you. So any show that you wanna do, do it. Period. Any, uh, we'll take one last question before we close out. There's a, we, oh, oh, are we behind? Okay, come on. One more in the room. How you doing, beloved? What's your name? Marie. Hi, Marie. Hi, I'm a set designer. Of, I'm a set designer based in Philly, and my question is, what is the most helpful thing a set designer can do for a costume designer in bringing a show to the stage? Okay, I can say for me, um, you know, uh, what's going? Hey, boo, let's communicate. I mean, honestly, just um, communication is is paramount, right? And so I think for me, I can see. Look, these geniuses might know, might have another experience, but I will say for me, um, with scenic, you know, sometimes it's helpful to know colors, right? Sometimes it's very helpful to know uh, treatments, right? What are the floors going to be, right? Uh, you may not be thinking, but like I've already read the script. I'm already thinking people going to be rolling across the stage. I know where these garments are from. This could be a period piece. You know, what, what kind, you know, I also want to talk to the props person, right? Like, what are y'all thinking of for colors? You know, uh, this is a, a, a little pink dress, so don't put her on no beige couch. You know, so these are things that, you know, for me that, I, look, pe look, people don't talk about it. We're in this rehearsal room, and it's given very much Ikea or whatever they had. And then you get to the tech, and it's like, look. And then, of course, oh, my God, queen, the dress, love it. We can't really see her. I'm like, well, baby, go, go, reaposter.com. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's what I think. Oh, my God, please don't tell my director this. I'd be like, girl, oh, well, then reaposter it. But so, for, uh, so as, the, as my collaborator, scenic designer, and trust me, I've honestly, like, I've been so blessed to work with artists. Uh, a lot of them are even in this building. So shout out to y'all. I love y'all down. But it's about dialogue. And they know, okay, Queen's gonna be crazy. So I'm like, yeah, you're right, you know. But it's about uh, being in dialogue, right? What are you imagining? But also to know that, like, we're coming from it with an understanding of dramaturgy, uh, with the understanding of movement, right? We've already talked with the choreographer, right? And so, you know, footwear is important. Um, we love, you know, one of the, what are those things called? Scaffolding. Oh, people love a scaffolding. So, as my scenic designer, as my scenic designer, tell me, you know, uh, well, well, what is the depth of these stairs, right? How wide is the scaffolding? Because they love to do, um, what is it called when you go further away? Ray, percent. oh my God, the rig stage, my God. Okay, so people love to do all these fabulous things, which we love to do them too, but I think being in dialogue so that where we can prepare from day one, right? And we can have, and it could change. We might get to text, like, girl, they gotta go. You're right. Mm -hmm. So, but we can be in dialogue and, 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 and be creatively aligned. Yeah, I would honestly say give us your budget. 
um, respectfully. Oh, hold um, on. I don't think they heard what production. What I said it in French. Um, let me repeat it. Okay, give, yes. Give us your budget. Um, we know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can share. Um, no, I'm joking. But uh, I'm not serious. Joking. <laughs> I, I take Zell. But um, outside of that, uh, just, I think the, maybe it's just me, but like, we're on the same team. Yes. When you look good, I look good. When I look good, you look good. So I would want to, and you inspire me, my love, too, in the future, when you are in your process of creating, because normally your timeline's like way earlier, me even stepping up to be like, hey, I think right now you're in your gestation period of creativity. Do you wanna have a conversation so that two months from now, I'm not seeing that the whole set is green um, and I can't use green, you know what I mean? And so I think if we were more collabor collaborators in that sense of the word of like, we're in partnership with one another, um, the world would be a better place. And it doesn't have to be, we're on opposite ends of it because we're like the bread. And everyone, everyone else is like the bologna and the lettuce and the cheese, but but we're the, we're the bread, and we could be really toasted, or we could be like not. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're the bread, and we're the bread winners. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Let me stop. Oh Child, they gonna kick me out of here, beloved. <laughs> You know, I mean, what I'm going to say to you is what I hope for the industry overall, because I do think that um, at the end of the day, we have a problem on the production side of not being a united front. Yeah. Um, and I think that I've worked with a lot of set designers because they do work so far ahead that when you get their design, that's it. There's no more discussion. This is what we've talked. This is what we've designed. Everybody loves it, and it's like, okay, but the perspective of this theater. I'm, we're like looking down to the floor. It's a Victorian show. You have pattern everywhere, and I have a show that's pattern and lace. So then, what happens? Because my clothes. Because you can actually do something a little plainer, maybe. Because there's a lot more in, in, in interior design in that period besides the patterns. I'm using an actually very specific story here, but <laughs> basically, <laughs> um, I, I do think that there is that there's more of a united front to be had from a set designer to a, to a costume designer, and that's even in pay equity, and and lighting designers pay equity with costume designers and and everybody besides the costume designers because we are paid the least. Just so you know. Um, um, and, and I think for that's the of time. for that's the amount of time. for sure. And so I think that's just like the thing that's really important to know is that like you want to go in as a united front because if you're going in already competing against one another, no one's going to get anything done. And so when you like you want to make this production the best you can, but you can't because you're already separate, you know. Um, so that's what I'll say. It's just like, like be willing to be like in collaboration after your design's even finished. Because we're in collaboration up until opening night. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. And I just want to, uh, okay. Oh, yes. Oh, the spirit of the wrap up. Oh, Father God. <laughs> Jesus. Father God, I hope that you wrap us all up, honey. Oh, yes. With, with more time, more budget. Um, <laughs> Better shoes. Um, oh my gosh. A better skincare. Okay. Um, <laughs> more time off. Please wrap me in that. Okay. Um, I will say, and, and just uh, to be so honest and serious, um, there is such uh, fragmentation in the work that we do. And it's not the work, the workers, or the artists, it's the structure, it's the infrastructure. Right, we have to name it. I'm gonna name it. Right, you know, we we show up ready to give our best at all times. We show up ready to be critically thinking. We show up to be radically thinking. We show up to be creatively thinking. We're always thinking. But you know, when we often hear what's that thing called? Favored nations. Favored nations. I, I ask so many people. Producers, uh, look, and some of them are here. Shout out to y'all family, right? What does favored nation mean? <laughs> okay, but what isn't true is that it's not true, right? We know that there's discrepancies there. Uh, things are reallocated, right? Um, th there are uh, discretionary funds, right, that get applied when they want to get applied. And so for me, it's like it's, it's very hard and very, very deb uh, debilitating to have to work in the deficit at all times.
In the deficit of time, deficit of resources, oftentimes we may not even have a place to work out of. And this is still happening in 2023. We don't have to all be at the Lyric Opera. We don't have to be at the this or the public say, okay, child, they're going to come after me. It's okay. Come after me. Um, but <laughs> it, 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 it's, it, it's to name it that there should be equity and respect at every place of employment, at every place of work. I'm happy to say, oh, I'm doing the clothes at the um, See You Next Week theater, you know, but the See You Next Week theater, right, should have the wherewithal to know how much time does it really take to make things happen. And there are things that, yes, we can't control Actors to Equity. Shout out to Actors Equity. There are things, you know, because of, of licensing. Shout out to them. But what we can do is create something that is not only equitable, but that is respectful. Respectful. Respecting our time. Respecting how we get things done. Respecting that, yeah, we are one costume designer, but we might need assistance. We might need associates. They have bills to pay. We have bills to pay. You're trying to pay me first now, first later, first and ever. Uh, that actually doesn't actually help me sustain. So therefore, what? I'm going to do three or four gigs, right, to make my rent payment. This is real. To make my rent payment. Right? And the institution, right, they all have salary paid. They all got their bonuses. They all got that good PPE loan. We did not. A lot of us, artists, a lot of my community members, a lot of my relatives, my family, my tribe. I shout out to NYU. A lot of us, we did not get that support. So again, we are starting in the deficit. But yes, we will always be critically thinking. We will always be creatively thinking. But we hope, and now you know, to think about what we also need. And don't think about it. Don't just put it in the theoretical. Put it into practice. If you don't know, if a production designer doesn't know, production manager don't know, ask. We're happy to tell you, but you have to pay too, because there's a fee for that. There's a fee. There is a fee for our intellectual property. You wouldn't bring any other consultant on any team, any project, without giving them a fee. And so when we're thinking about these things, how to move forward for the future, these are the big ways that we begin. It is not the final end. It's not just this one step. It's the beginning of the steps, and it'll evolve. As we evolve, as our projects evolve, as the locations evolve, we must rise up with the times. And that must mean respecting not only the people on stage, the people backstage, the people literally making the stage happen every night. Thank you all. Thank you, Devario. Thank you, Dominique.